Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. In recent years, we keep hearing about quantum computers, but how do they actually work? How does it compare to classical computing? What problems are they good at solving? Why are they so significant? And where are we at with their development? Those are some of the things we'll be talking about in this video. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons and let's get started. Quantum computing is something I've wanted to cover for a while and one of my patrons also requested it. So thank you very much for your support and this one's for you Hung. So let's start by talking about how quantum computers work. Since it works at the quantum level, all the quantum effects can start to play a role in how it computes. But for now it looks like there are three quantum effects that we're really trying to harness and control in quantum computers. Quantum tunneling, quantum entanglement and quantum superposition. Now, each of these three quantum effects deserve their own dedicated video to talk about, so I'll just try to give you the information that's pertinent to quantum computing in this video and leave the rest for a series of videos specifically on quantum effects. The most important one of these quantum effects in quantum computing is superposition. At the core of a classical computer, for the smallest bits of information, transistors are required that each have a voltage threshold. If the voltage is higher than the threshold, the value of the bit is considered a 1. If the voltage is lower than the threshold, the value of the bit is considered to be a 0. That's where it stops for a classical computer. A bit can only have the values 0 or 1. A quantum computer, on the other hand, can also have a state of superposition where the qubit is undecided. This can be thought of as having the value of 0 and 1 simultaneously, or neither. So essentially, quantum superposition is the fundamental principle that two states can be added together and form another valid quantum state. But the main thing to note here is that the quantum effect of superposition allows an additional state for every bit that we simply don't have with classical computing. So let's compare the classical bits with the qubits of quantum computers to better understand the fundamental differences between them and why the computational power is so much greater with qubits. When you have a system with a certain amount of bits, those bits can always represent 2 to the power of n different values. For example, a system with 3 bits means you can have 2 to the power of 3 different values for a total of 8 different possible values, as you can see here. With a classical computer and classical bits, every bit has a value of either 0 or 1, and that's all you get. So you're always representing only a single one of those 2 to the power of n possibilities at any one time. With a quantum computer though, those qubits can be in a superposition of all of those states at the same time. So the qubits can actually represent all of those 2 to the power of n possibilities all at the same time. This difference really starts to show when we start adding bits to the system, so let's quickly compare the computational power of classical bits versus qubits. With a system of two bits, a quantum computer can be in a superposition of four states at the same time. With a system of three bits, we're up to a total of eight different states that are superposed. With a system of 16 bits, we're now up to 65,536 different states that are superposed. And finally, for a system of just 64 bits, we're now at almost 18.56 trillion different states that are superposed. And that's just for a small 64-bit system. While the quantum computer grows exponentially in computational power with its superposition of all the different states, the classical computer continues to only represent a single one of those values at any one time. Now if you haven't seen my videos on the double slit experiment, I would suggest you check those out to understand how particles can behave both as waves and as particles at the same time, because for this next part we need to talk about how a quantum computer actually uses those qubits. If you did uh, check out my other videos, you should already be aware that performing an observation on a particle will collapse its wave function and force it to determine its current state and location. With quantum computers, it's no different and the same thing happens. While the qubits are in a superposition of states to form all these possible values all at once, we can't exactly use that quantum state. 
as soon as we would try to detect anything about it, it would act as an interaction with something outside of that quantum system and the wave function of the qubits would collapse. This collapse is what makes the quantum computer settle on only one of those possibilities as a final result of bits of information, exactly like a classical computer. In other words, while we're performing computations, we can use a very powerful quantum state, but as soon as we read the result, it will settle down to a classical state that's based on probabilities. This means that if you run the same computation many times, you won't always end up with the same result because the probabilistic nature uh, of the qubits might make them settle on different values for the same computation. In order to increase the likelihood uh, of having a correct result, the uncertainty has to be reduced by running the computation multiple times. Now this uncertainty might seem like a traditional bug, but this is actually a feature that helps us determine the confidence level in the answer that the quantum computer provides. So, uh, for example, if you ask a quantum computer to identify an image of an apple 100 times and it returns the label apple 100 times, then you know the confidence level is extremely high in identifying the image as containing an apple. However, if the computer returns the label apple only 50 times, with strawberries uh, 45 times and a few other labels 5 times, then you know it's fairly confident that it's an apple but it thinks it also has similarities to strawberries and a few other things. If the image you asked it to analyze contains both an apple and strawberries, then it would be perfectly correct in its analysis of the image. So the uncertainty is not at all a bad thing. It can actually be an extremely powerful tool when you ask the computer to make complex decisions and learn about the world. So what type of problems are quantum computers good at solving? Well, as of right now, the main thing we can imagine it being really good at is solving optimization problems. Let's take a look at a little game that showcases well how quantum computers will accomplish this in record time, the light switch game. Uh, so the point of this game is to get the combination that yields the lowest total value that's possible with the switches given. We'll start with a simple version where each light switch has a bias value associated to it. Turning a switch to the on position has a value of plus one and the off position has a value of minus one. Whatever you choose to do with the switch, you have to take that plus one or minus one value corresponding to the on off position and multiply that with the bias. Then all we do uh, is add up all the values of the switches to get the grand total. So for this problem, there's a really easy solution that we can analyze and find very quickly as humans. If the switch has a positive bias, we'll turn it off. And if the switch has a negative bias, we'll turn it on. This will always give us the lowest possible grand total and will win the game. With a classical computer, there is no other way about it other than to run all the possibilities in order to settle on the one with the lowest value as our answer. With a quantum computer, on the other hand, we really only have to run through the problem once and gradually turn off the superposition as we move along to settle on the classical bits that give the lowest value. So where a classical computer has to run the problem 2 to the power of n times for a solution, a quantum computer just has to let the quantum effects play their role and give us the answer as we move only once through the problem. This difference of how the problem is approached by each type of computer doesn't matter too much when, we're, uh, when there are only two switches, but as you add more and more, it can quickly become impossible for a classical computer to solve. For example, this game with two switches has only four possible answers, so it would take about as much time for a classical computer to solve as a quantum computer. With 10 switches though, a classical computer is now required to run the problem 1024 times to get the answer. With only 100 switches, the quantum computer can still solve it faster than a classical computer could solve 10 switches, but the classical computer can't solve this game anymore due to having 1.2 nonillion possible answers. That's a 1 followed by 30 zeros. So as you can see, quantum computers can greatly improve how we deal with these optimization problems. 
As a side note, you might also be thinking that there might be a way to just program the classical computer with that positive or negative bias rule to decide which switch to turn on and off and it would be able to solve it very quickly. Well, in response to that, let's simply add one more bias to the game that's shared between switches. This new bias will need to be multiplied with the final value on both switches. With just this simple change, the classical computer is back to square one, because now there's no easy rule to program because all switches now affect their neighbors. So it, it'll still have to run the, uh, through all the possible switch settings to figure out which combination is best. The quantum computer, on the other hand, doesn't have any problem solving this one as quickly as the previous, uh, without needing to take any special care in how we approach the problem. So now that you have a grasp of how powerful a quantum computer can be with an optimization problem, let's dive in a little deeper with another example using a landscape with hills and valleys. The reason why we use a landscape here is that for artificial intelligence, that's pretty much exactly what we have to deal with when we're trying to optimize the way it learns. This is an error landscape, where we have to find the lowest possible point on the map to get the best learning that we can. This lowest possible point on the map is called the global minimum. So the way that we approach this problem with classical computing is that we essentially choose a starting location somewhat randomly, look around us, analyze the steepest downhill climb, take a small step in that direction and repeat many many times until you find the lowest point. The problem though with this approach is that you can easily get stuck in a local minimum where everything around you is uphill, but you're still not at the lowest point on the map. This makes it very hard to optimize the learning opportunity unless you repeat it many times with different starting positions. Doing that comes at a great cost though, where uh, the learning slows down considerably, and often to the point where it's unrealistic to use this approach and expect good results within a reasonable time frame. So here quantum computers have many advantages over classical computers for uh, navigating that landscape to find the global minimum and maximize the learning opportunity. The first is that quantum superposition allows the traveler to start in multiple locations simultaneously, which greatly increases the chances of finding the global minimum. The second is that quantum tunneling allows the traveler to sometimes go through hills instead of having to climb them, which helps to avoid getting stuck in a local minimum. And the third is quantum entanglement, which allows the traveler to discover correlations between coordinates that lead to deep valleys. All of these help tremendously in finding the global minimum which in turn maximizes the learning opportunity and greatly increases the speed at which artificial intelligence can learn how to handle com complex problems uh, about the world. With classical computers, there are also other limitations that we need to mention here. The first is that the transistors today are so small that quantum effects are already affecting them, so we can't really minimize them any further. It's also very hard to dissipate heat efficiently from such small devices, so that adds another challenge entirely. Also, uh, there are limits to how big of a speedup we can get from using devices in parallel, so adding more and more cores to our CPUs won't continue improving the overall performance of our computers. Here's a small graph about this that represents Amdahl's law. As you can see on this graph, we're very close already to the point where we have almost no benefit to adding more cores, and it simply won't be worth the additional cost. In general, it's harder and harder for companies to justify the huge effort that has to be put in on developing new processor generations. Quantum computers, on the other hand, can offer a lot when it comes to advancements. Where a classical computer has to double its bits to double its power, a quantum computer doubles its processing power for every single additional qubit it has. With quantum computers, there are a lot of fields of study that will benefit greatly from this ability to solve optimization problems. One of the fields that's expected to be one of the most important applications is quantum simulation for chemistry and nanotechnology. 
Uh, quantum simulation could be used to simulate the behavior of atoms and particles at unusual conditions, such as the reactions inside a collider. Other fields that will improve are image recognition, extracting meaning from text, uh, detecting and tracking objects and images and video, finding correlations in biological data, improving natural language in machines, creating and testing scientific hypotheses, improving travel, making industrial processes more energy efficient by multiple orders of magnitude, and probably much more that we haven't even thought of yet. Just like the scientists that developed the first classical computers, they couldn't imagine that it would eventually be integrated everywhere like it is today, with people connected essentially 100% of the time. So we can't really tell how significant it'll be once we really master the technology and start integrating it in our current computers. We expect that some hybrid systems will be developed uh, that use classical computing for what it's good at and quantum computing for what it's also good at, giving us uh, computer systems that can tackle anything we throw at it. But now, as with anything that promises to bring more power and more opportunities, there are concerns that go along with it. For quantum computers, one of the main concerns is security through cryptography. Uh, most of the encryption that's in use today uses public and private keys that are based on extremely large prime numbers that are hundreds of digits long. Classical computers can't solve this problem when the prime numbers that are used become very large, so encrypted data is considered secure. When the keys are sufficiently large, a classical computer would require more time than the current age of our universe to solve. Quantum computers, on the other hand, are able to use Shor's algorithm to find the prime factors of the key very quickly, and we're talking about only a few minutes or seconds here. Because of this, quantum computers have the capability of rendering most of the security in use today completely unsafe. Now, this causes a lot of concerns when it comes to things like national security with the military and such. Fortunately, there are other traditional cryptographic algorithms that don't appear to be broken by Shor's algorithm and quantum computing. There's also an entire field of quantum cryptography that's being studied more and more, with quantum computers being in development. So it's very likely that the military will be ahead of this change and will be able to adapt. So, when it comes to things like national security, I think the secrets are likely to remain safe. But for everything else that the general public uses, we'll need to adapt to this new cryptography uh, to be able to ensure security again. So where are we at with the development of quantum computers today? Well, there are many things that we need to resolve to really bring out the power of quantum computing. The qubits that we have in use today are pretty bad in comparison to what they will be once we solve some of the issues. One of the big obstacles is that qubits are extremely sensitive to any sort of background noise, so they currently need to operate at around 15 millikelvins. This is a staggering 200 times colder than the coldest temperature that outer space can get to. This is needed because every interaction with the outside world destroys the quantum state of superposition, which is otherwise known as quantum decoherence. Another challenge is when a, qu a quantum computer has to perform a time-consuming task. This presents a real issue because it greatly increases the chances of decoherence during that computation. We either need to find a method of isolating the qubits extremely well and with a minimum of energy uh, needed to maintain that isolation, or we need to develop some really great quantum error correction that can correct decoherence faster than it's introduced. Um, another big issue is that it's very hard to make two arbitrary qubits interact with each other, so it limits their computing power significantly. And lastly, they currently have to compete with classical computers in many ways, and classical computers have about 50 years of head start. But even though the current state is not so great, there are a ton of people working on refining this technology. What we would need for the really impressive advancements are about 500 perfectly connected qubits. For some of the smaller stuff, but still rather impressive stuff, about 100 perfectly connected qubits should be enough. 
As of January 2019, IBM unveiled its first commercial quantum computer, the IBM Q System 1, that has 20 qubits. CERN, ExxonMobil, Fermilab, Argonne National Laboratory, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory are among the clients that are signed up to access the computer through the cloud. For more information about every bit of advancement we've made in this field, I'll leave a link in the description of a wiki page that has a nice timeline of the advancements in quantum computing from the beginning to now that you can check out if you're curious. I hope you enjoyed this video and perhaps learned a little something. I also want to thank my patrons on Patreon for supporting the channel and thanks again to Hung for the suggestion to make this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to join us on Discord for a more direct chat with me and about 40 other viewers of the channel that all enjoy science, see the link in the description for the invite link. If you have any suggestions about science topics or recent science news that you'd like me to cover, don't hesitate to write it down in the comments. Also, if you have any science questions for the series where I answer your science questions, you can ask me that too in the comments. For more interesting science content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification to be notified of all my uploads. You can also check out my website at respectyourintellect.com for all the information and videos on this channel. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.